So good morning. Uh, today is March 7th, 2018. Uh, I'm together with John McLeod. We are in the library of the Cincinnati Psychoanalytic Institute, and I will be interviewing him as part of the Institute's oral history project. My name is Jack Lindy. Uh, by way of background, I studied at the uh, University of Cincinnati Department of Psychiatry, uh, <clears throat> completed analytic training at the Chicago Institute, became a faculty member here in the 80s, uh, then a training and supervising analyst. And I took my turn as director in the 1990s. Uh, I'm now a member of the emeritus faculty. We'll learn about John McLeod's career as the interview goes on, but for those of you unfamiliar with him, some preliminaries I think are in order. Uh, first, that he is 92 years old. Uh, second, that he uh, was a training and supervising analyst uh, and the visionary and founding director of uh, CPI. Uh, today, he's also an emeritus. Is that right? That's right. So let me ask, to begin with, uh, what brought you to Cincinnati? And what led you to be interested in a career in psychiatry and psychoanalysis? Well, it, di it didn't start out that way. In medical school, well, the first year or two, I thought I was going to be a surgeon. But uh, I became more interested in internal medicine. And then in... Uh, uh, psychosomatic medicine because it was very obvious to me uh, how influential the emotional life of uh, patients was with regard to uh, their experience of uh, physical uh, uh, illness and difficulties. Uh, as part of that, uh, I was sort of in transition as I graduated from medical school. I took a rotating internship and then a straight medical internship at Hartford Hospital. And during that time, I explored training possibilities. I thought I sh should have a year or so of psychiatry if our, my interests in psychosomatic medicine were, were to be uh, promoted. Uh, and the uh, program at uh, Cincinnati stood out. Hmm. Uh, it was at a time when Maury Levine had uh, uh, just become chairman. He had come to Cincinnati in the early 30s from a residency in psychiatry at Hopkins under Adolf Meyer and was uh, more than sympathetic. He was interested in uh, psychoanalysis and shortly after he got here began his analytic experience in Chicago with Franz Alexander and uh, had his uh, psychoanalytic training and supervised uh, supervision of his uh, analytic work up there as well. That set a pattern of uh, commuting uh, to uh, Chicago, which it, of course at that time was uh, mostly by train. Uh, and uh, various faculty members uh, went to uh, uh, Chicago and became uh, analysts. And the program became recognized as uh, strongly psychoanalytic in its orientation. Uh, it, that was attractive uh, to me, but the, the uh, teaching capacity and talent that Levine had, as well as administrative capacity, drew me, and I uh, was very happy to uh, come here for training. And that was in uh, J July of uh, 1950, simultaneous with the Korean War breaking out. Mm. And I was only here a month or two and then uh, uh, went into the Air Force for, for a couple of years. Came back uh, in July of 1952 and I uh, had in mind being here a year or two and uh, here I am, <laughs> a, a few years later. Uh, the, uh, 
progression there was that as I got more into psychiatry and began to have more experience doing uh, psychotherapy, I could see the benefit of uh, both a personal analysis and uh, ongoing supervision and experience firsthand uh, working intensively with patients. And it, it did uh, uh, grip me, uh, and, and that was my decision, gradually uh, solidifying over the next few years so that uh, I, I did uh, apply to the uh, Chicago Institute. Commuting was continuing, and I was one of a number of faculty who were uh, doing that. Uh, Jim Titchener and I were in the same class at the Institute. Uh, now, all along, uh, it was clear that uh, Levine wanted to have a, an institute here in uh, Cincinnati. But, uh, but the dilemma was also clear uh, that uh, if an institute uh, were to develop, the very talented uh, and uh, expert teaching faculty that he had, and research as well, that he had uh, gathered uh, would be strained. They to both run and teach in an institute uh, for psychoanalysis as well as in the general program in psychiatry, adult and child uh, was going to uh, create some uh, stresses. But the, the interest continued to grow and we developed a relationship with the Institute for Psychoanalysis in Chicago. Well, as, I wanted to ask, uh, <clears throat> Just at that point now, um, if I have my facts correct, you you were just completing uh, a period of time as director of the central clinic within the department. Right. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, with these variables going on, what led you to think that the time was right for an institute here? Well, um, I, uh, I was a director of uh, Central Clinic for uh, uh, 10 or 11 years, and uh, it, w it was a very uh, uh, productive time for, for me as far as having a chance to uh, be an administrator in a program that was uh, well-staffed. And uh, by that time, there were 50 residents uh, from all around the country. It was a very uh, good resident group, and the program was uh, nationally recognized as one of the uh, top-rated uh, and popular uh, programs in the uh, country. Uh, as I gained experience, uh, I, th I felt that uh, uh, there were enough faculty uh, who could uh, have significant time mobilized for institute development. I personally felt that it would be easier to accomplish that if the institute was not integrated into the Department of Psychiatry, but rather uh, independent and having its own board and so forth. Uh, that was a debated uh, uh, question for, for a number of years. But as uh, I got 10 or 12 years of the clinic experience, I felt a uh, decision point coming for me of wanting to uh, develop a practice group uh, outside the uh, department and more or less as a step toward uh, that becoming an, a, a starting point for the Psychoanalytic Institute. I, I did not favor the Institute being integrated in the, into the uh, department. The number of uh, faculty who were by then fully trained uh, gave me the feeling that there would be the uh, talent and experience to uh, 
uh, function as an analytic uh, faculty. So, and, and this this whole um, <clears throat> connection to and separation from Chicago was really a story in itself. Yes, it was. It was. Uh, as, uh, as time went on, Bob Stewart came from Chicago. He was uh, uh, an experienced analyst and was a training analyst as he came to Cincinnati. And his position, particular position was to uh, be a front runner in uh, developing uh, the institute program here in uh, Cincinnati. Uh, Quite a bit of time went into the relationship with Chicago. Uh, they tr when I graduated, there's a five-year period after graduation. Then I became a uh, training analyst, and the uh, uh, all of the training analysts there were five or six, and that was that's an important uh, point. There needs to be five uh, training analysts at least at that, that time. Uh, in order for an institute to have recognition as an independent facility. Uh, and we were moving in that direction. But the <coughs> training analysts twice a year would have a weekend in Chicago where they talked over developments, gave papers on supervision and institute organization. And they met with uh, uh, comparable groups from uh, St. Louis, and uh, also from uh, Denver. So, so it was a, a very significant uh, uh, gathering of uh, psychoanalytic educators. That went on for a number of years. And there was a committee from the American Psychoanalytic Association, the Committee on New Training Facilities, who uh, were part of that uh, Chicago experience twice a year. And at uh, a point, a few years into this, uh, the Committee on New Training Facilities uh, indicated they favored us getting started at that point. They felt that we, we had the uh, necessary uh, uh, analytic manpower to uh, make the Institute in Cincinnati uh, a going concern. At the same time, uh, more people were, more uh, candidates, potential candidates, were being analyzed in Cincinnati. And uh, when we got the green light from the National Committee and from Chicago, uh, we saw that we could have a class of six as our, uh, six psychiatrists ready for uh, analytic training uh, in, uh, in uh, Cincinnati. Our idea was to be regional from the beginning, not just Cincinnati, but uh, Dayton, Lexington, uh, Louisville, et cetera. Well, I was going to ask as you get into this question, uh, the group of, of uh, uh, analysts uh, that you're describing as this uh, group that would become the faculty, I, I had a chance to work with them when I was residency training director, and I would have to say that uh, <clears throat> uh, they're dearly departed at this point. However, they were a heck of a crew, yeah. um, and I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Bob Stewart and uh, Roy Whitman and Jim Titchener and Paul Ornstein, and I'm sure I'm Stan Kaplan. Stan Kaplan. Um, uh, getting these people to work together uh, is an art form, uh, and I, I wanted to well, that's ask. The job. <laughs> I would, w wanted to ask how you thought about that and what you did. Well, I I don't have any vignettes to offer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was a talented uh, and very independent group, and they didn't uh, always uh, see the same same picture as you looked at the, uh, a, a situation. 
Well, I was uh, think, but over, thinking, your, overall, thinking your, your concept of having them teach each other yes. was, was a, a bit of a genius. Uh, it, it, uh, it did work. Um, and we, uh, it was a Saturday morning. Uh, the Chicago Institute, by the way, was a Friday and Saturday uh, experience. Going up uh, Friday evening to Chicago, Thursday evening to Chicago, and then all day Friday and uh, Saturday morning. So our practice uh, curriculum and teaching here in Cincinnati was Saturday morning. Uh, and the timing of the Institute teaching was very similar uh, to, Chicago, to Chicago. Not all institutes do that. There's quite a range of experience in that, in, in that regard. But the, they worked in groups of, we had sort of four teaching groups of three or four people apiece and uh, psychopathology development, uh, clinical seminars. Uh, I'm one I'm leaving out right now, but uh, uh, that group experience and then teaching the whole faculty uh, was an important developmental step. Uh, we actually uh, theory. Hmm? Was theory the other uh, dimension? You said you, you, there was one other group of courses. Theory, theory. theory was the, the other. Yeah. Theory was the other one. Uh, yes. I, I was thinking that theory. I left it out. Well, but, but maybe for good <laughs> reasons. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but it, it, uh, it accomplished its uh, purpose. And the following year, uh, we did start our uh, class, uh, first class. And, and the kind of collaboration which uh, Levine made possible is demonstrated uh, at this point by uh, the Institute, Institute used the seminar rooms in the Department of Psychiatry as their classroom. They used the uh, library of the department and of the uh, medical center as their library. Uh, and a lot of the teachers remained geographic full-time faculty in the, in the uh, department. Uh, it, it was uh, very interesting. Now, along with this, I had, with a partner, uh, Horatia Wood, uh, built a practice building. Uh, I, I left the department when I was uh, 40 years of age and I'm trying to figure out what the date would be. That would be 65, 1965. And in the year or two following that, we built 2,600 Euclid, which held 12 uh, independent offices, uh, as well as a group and seminar room uh, for uh, mental health professionals. It wasn't just analysts, although a, a number of analysts uh, were in the group. And that group, uh, uh, it uh, flourished and uh, uh, I was there for a good number of years. And then a, a very uh, important development, uh, we, we began to have people who had, uh, following uh, my graduation, had grad commuted and then graduated from uh, Chicago and uh, then had a practice experience so that they were qualified as far as time uh, to be evaluated as training analysts. And three of those analysts came to see me and said, we're ready to take the next step. We'd like to be evaluated as training analysts, Lou Spitz, Maury Oshowitz, and uh, Fader Hagenauer. And uh, I, I said, well, then let's set up the evaluation process. And, the, and uh, we uh, did that. But with, with that uh, stimulus, uh, we also began to think that uh, we needed our own 
uh, Institute building. Up until that time, the administrative work uh, for the Institute, which was focused in my office, and that uh, was more or less uh, simultaneous as I became a training analyst. I, I became the uh, uh, acting director. There wasn't, any, there wasn't an institute yet. But the, the administrative things having to do with the uh, embryonic institute were focused at, at 2600. Uh, all of the back and forth with the uh, Department of Psychiatry. Um, Dorothy Donahue, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Levine's secretary, retired and she began to work part time. Mm. Uh, in my office mm. as the institute secretary. Uh, then we needed more time and Sonny Schreier came in as the oh, uh, yes. uh, institute secretary. She was the uh, school teacher and uh, the, the, uh, she later said that what we were looking for was a, a smart broad who could keep her mouth shut. <laughs> 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 and she qualified. Yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, but we were uh, looking ahead to uh, the uh, institute program starting, and some of the classes uh, were held, uh, particularly Saturday morning, at, at the 2600 building, uh, rather than the seminar. Now, I and, should I should say for the the listening and watching audience who does not know this that in addition to your many talents, one is architectural, and that you've had an interest in that for some time. And this notion of building a new building <clears throat> was not an abstract uh, <laughs> a, a affair, but one that you, we were, are. <laughs> you were, yeah, here we are. Yeah. Um, uh, and any reflections on uh, how it came to be the way it is and how you feel about it? and what well, your contribution to it was. I, I do have some, some uh, ideas about it. My experience as the director of the clinic gave me a lot of information about uh, how a mental health center uh, might best be organized. Uh, and um, some of that uh, uh, is embodied in the way that this building is. Where it was uh, conceptualized. Uh, the 2600 Euclid had modules of three professional offices around a professional secretarial area, a waiting room, utility room, and so forth. And that worked very well for the general practice of uh, psychiatry, which is essentially what we were, we were doing there. I felt that uh, we could uh, uh, do well with a different ratio of uh, professionals to secretarial help. And the model here is five professional offices around a sec pro professional secretarial area and waiting room and so forth. So we started off with three five uh, office modules. Uh, that was the the idea, and then a fourth module, which is the institute space. Uh, and uh, uh, th there we had the idea of this uh, conference room with uh, the capacity to be divided so that more than one seminar could go on at a time here. And the library uh, was very, it was a key element in the planning. Uh, around that time, Fred Cap passed away and he uh, left his library, which was really quite extensive. And uh, uh, Dr. Levine left a good part of his, his library. So we, we had foundation uh, for, for the library part of it. The five uh, unit uh, professional suite worked out well. You were here for yes. many mm -hmm. years and yes. you had the secretarial need 
the concept was all your professional work would be handled by the secretarial group. Uh, we had uh, three uh, secretaries to start out with, and uh, then uh, the group wanted to enlarge and added 10 more offices so that we have had the 25 uh, offices. I was concerned about that step, just, just by the way. I, I, would, I felt that there were complications there, and, and I knew I would not be able to supervise the, the work of the addition because I had gotten into some uh, responsibilities on the, on the national level that were uh, taking a, a, a great deal of time. Before we leave the building, any comments on the atrium? Well, the atrium, the, the comment on the atrium is that I did not want a building where you entered into corridors. Uh, I wanted a welcoming uh, atmosphere as you came into the building it, it, with light and the skylights uh, did that. As the building was being designed, and, and I'm just trying to re remember at what point I introduced this idea to the architect, I said to the architect, in the middle of the atrium above it as a second level would be a wonderful spot for a reading room, part of a library. Is there any way we could design uh, a stairway which would fit in without wrecking all of the proportionality which had, uh, had developed. And uh, he, he looked a little puzzled, but he came back the next day and he said, here it is. Oh, isn't that great? And that's the McLeod Reading Room. Yes, that's the McLeod Reading Room. Yeah. Now, I don't know that it's a reading room anymore. <laughs> <laughs> But, but that, well, that was the... Well, my wife, I'll, I'll just say my wife wrote her thesis for Smith, uh, 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 PhD thesis, uh, in that reading room. And so she expresses her gratitude. Yeah. Uh, as well, it, it's a, a, a beautiful uh, room with lots of light, lots, lots of, light. of vistas. Yes. Uh, and a very quiet uh, atmosphere. It's been used for administrative things a lot. We used it as a, a seminar room, too. Yes. So, multi-use. Multi-use. Now, in order to, to do this, this is another one of your group, que group questions. Uh, the, the Psychoanalytic Institute, uh, an effort was made to move ahead a little bit when Lou Gottschalk was here. He was a a training analyst focused on uh, uh, research full-time in the uh, department. But uh, he had the idea, he had some research money that uh, he, he thought could become part of a foundation. And he organized a psychoanalytic foundation, which had a lot of uh, interested uh, community people in it. That basically transitioned to be the board of the Institute. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, for example, Dick Forberg, a P&G executive, was the president of that foundation, and he became the president of the Psychoanalytic Foundation. Um, then people were added, uh, and Several people from the foundation, and I'll mention their names, became significant players as far as uh, the creation of this building. Essentially what we did was uh, organize 12 people. You were one. Were you an original uh, partner in the, in the building? Uh, I think... I think uh, very shortly after the original partners. Yeah. Well, the, the 12 <clears throat> partners pledged enough money so that uh, we were looking for ground and where to build. And 
the Bodman Widow's Home was here. They had just been torn down, and this block was for sale, although it had about five or six residential homes around the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the uh, square, the, 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 the whole block. So we, the 12 uh, people organized as a partnership and uh, ended up buying the, this property and uh, getting an architect and then we went from there with the planning. Uh, and uh, we also got a uh, industrial revenue bond uh, to, uh, for a loan for the building, which involved going through probate court and a lot of legal activity, which we have uh, uh, archived <laughs> in, in, large, in large volumes. Um, other people besides uh, Dick uh, Forberg was uh, Judge Bob Black was on the board then, and Betty Goldsmith, the people who became president later on of, of the uh, foundation. They were partners, and the only non-occupant uh, of the new building who was a psychiatrist uh, was uh, Stan Kaplan. He was a partner. So uh, it worked, uh, and and we ended up with a uh, with a very functional building. Um, do you remember Ed Stein? I do. Uh, one reason I think of him, I've just been down in Florida, in Tampa. I didn't look him up, but that that's where he ended up after he uh, trained at uh, the Chicago Psychoanalytic. He visited the building, and he had a, the same kind of architectural mind that I seem to have, and, and he said, this is exactly right. Oh, great. <laughs> Isn't that great? He, he understood the, the, yeah. the, uh, the concept uh, right away. It was very interesting. Well, um, I, 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 was, uh, I moved into the building, I think, in 81, 82, shortly after it was opened. Yeah, 80, 81 was it, it yeah. And, and I, would, I would support Ed Stein's view. It, it certainly was uh, a remarkable place. I wanted to pick up uh, uh, some thoughts. Before we yeah. leave, soundproofing was crucial. And this is a soundproof building. Yes, yes, yes. Confidentiality. By, by design. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to, uh, you have demonstrated by, by just your narrative that you are so much more, you are an analyst, uh, uh, also a planner. Um, uh, I think I'm learning that you were uh, took advantage of opportunities that were there, put things together, but you also were a bit of a um, structural thinker about how the institute would work. Um, and gave a lot of thought to that, and so um, at least my experience going from this institute to other institutes was People raise their eyebrows. What do you mean a lay board? I don't understand what you're talking about. Uh, of various ways we were structured with regard to training analysts and yeah. non-training analysts. And I wondered if you would give a little bit of commentary let, on that. Let me try to do that. Um, when I was the uh, executive director of the Central Clinic, it was a large community chest, state of Ohio supported clinic, also functioning as the psychiatric outpatient department of the General Hospital. It was enough of a separate entity that it had its own board. The board met regularly, budgetary things. And, and I saw, the, and this was Levine uh, who uh, made it happen that way. Uh, presenting budgets to the community chess, to Columbus, the state of Ohio. And uh, the way he used the board as a uh, 
communications channel to the community. Uh, the, uh, the way the board became sophisticated about my mental health issues uh, and training issues, it, it just impressed me a great deal. Now, of all things, not all the institutes have boards, but Chicago has a board of trustees. And I felt the same way there, that the, the, the board uh, of the Institute in Chicago was very alive and very uh, connected uh, with the at, uh, activities and uh, very supportive of the various initiatives. And Chicago certainly had more than uh, the average institute did in, in the way of initiatives, teachers programs, uh, various educational programs about uh, mental health and mental illness. Um, uh, the way they ran the clinic in Chicago. The emphasis they gave to the library in Chicago. Uh, all boards supported. So, so that uh, I, I felt they, uh, that I, I wanted to have a board. And uh, now a board is time consuming, but it always felt to me that it was worthwhile, uh, not, not just financially, but the whole community interconnections that you, that you can uh, develop. I, one of the first things I did when I went into practice was have more of a connection with the community chest and was on a budget committee hearing the budgets of various and, and making decisions about budgets of various community organizations. It was a very good educational experience. So uh, that, that's all part of the background. Uh, you mentioned how um, there were certain numbers necessary to take certain steps, like the yeah. number of analysts, yeah. uh, and then um, the additional analysts coming in. Um, uh, and I'm remembering <clears throat> that uh, a phrase uh, that uh, caught my imagination in terms of administration was a critical mass. Um, that it's a phrase you would use about whether we're ready to go ahead with something, right. whether we're ready to focus down on something. And I wondered whether you had any thoughts about that phrase, metaphor for leadership and how you saw it over the years. Uh, I, I did have that uh, concept in, in mind as uh, uh, we uh, went along at, uh, particularly about the numbers of faculty uh, with whom uh, uh, we would be working. And somehow or other, the idea of 15 like this, <laughs> uh, it's somewhere around that that I, uh, I see uh, a group of analysts working as intimately as, as we have. Uh, having uh, a chance for their own space, their own career development, and yet uh, ha having the opportunity to work as a, as a practice and as a uh, teaching group, a faculty. Um, I was concerned in part when we added uh, the 10 offices, I was worried about the critical mass being exceeded uh, a little bit, and I may have been right, uh, but uh, it, it, it overall has worked uh, uh, pretty well. Um, the, the group process of an institute is, is uh, very hard to identify and to uh, manage. I'm not sure it does it get managed. But um, one of the things that I had done in, in getting ready for, for the Institute, I became a member of the Committee on Institutes of the American through a good friendship with uh, Ed Weinschel, who was chair of the uh, 
board on professional standards at that time. And I, I visited uh, as a uh, site visit group committee member three different institutes during the first few years that we were operating. It was, it was uh, uh, remarkably uh, rewarding uh, to do that. Uh, Pittsburgh, which had its uh, own problems. Uh, Columbia, a completely different uh, arrangement for, for an institute, unique. They're all unique. Pittsburgh was unique. Uh, and um, the last one was uh, Seattle. Uh, they, and the idea of critical mass is different in all of those arrangements. The administrative arrangements influence that idea. One concept also that you've heard me talk about uh, often is uh, the, the concept of uh, um, collaboration. Uh, I'm blocking on a word that was in my mind a minute ago. Working, uh, that if uh, two groups work together, there's a, a uh, you have more, one and one makes more than two. You have a working together there that has more energy, uh, more creativity, uh, more initiative than, than uh, the, the two groups. Uh, well, I've always thought that your leadership was so helpful for a small city, a small institute uh, that needed to remain stimulated by the larger uh, analytic world, but also um, small enough to be engaged with so many important things going on in our own world. Yes. Uh, and uh, a source of uh, our own vitality, uh, as well as uh, the influence of others. Um, yeah. And uh, there's something about an openness to new influence that I always admired about yeah. how you were uh, structured things, including the Education Committee, which at one point in time um, uh, had to have a balance between training analysts and non-training analysts right. to make sure it doesn't become an oligarchy of the old, pe old That's right. folks. That's right. Um, no, the, the <clears throat> whole experience of the training and uh, the Education Committee is a a story in itself, uh, and and very important. I I had a, a mindset about the uh, uh, minutes of the uh, education committee. I I probably spent more time than necessary, but I saw it as an archive of of the whole institute. Everything that went on, I fed through the education committee, and I treated it as at the creation of an archive of, of the Institute experience. Interesting. And Very interesting. I don't know whether those minutes are still available. I didn't make copies of them for myself, but... Well, some of your successors have been more loquacious. <laughs> uh, and uh, they interrupt each other, and I'm not sure that their word for words <laughs> fall, fall yeah. into the category that, of archival. That, that, uh, that could be, uh, yeah. So uh, you were director for 17 years. Yes. So yeah. to take a broad sweep of that time, which I'm thinking is mostly in the 80s, some in the 70s. Uh, into I don't the, know, into I, yeah, the 90s. Beginning into the 90s. Yeah. Um, if you were to look back uh, on your legacy, um, are there... Um, events, activities, decisions uh, that uh, came under your jurisdiction um, or under your leadership that um, are important to the legacy that you leave? Al, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm not sure. It's, uh, it's long ago enough that uh, I have trouble uh, separating out partic particular issues or 
or events. I, I did not feel burdened by uh, that 17 years. I was ready to, to move on well before the uh, 17 years, but uh, uh, we had a, a issue as far as leadership being available. And uh, that culminated in, just as Lou Spitz and I were talking about his becoming director, he had a heart attack. And so that delayed things for another uh, year or two. Uh, but I, I, I felt uh, uh, happy about turning over the office and, and uh, uh, but not particularly unburdened. I had more things to do. I was, I, I inadvertently became chair of the American Committee on Non-Medical Clinical Training, uh, and that turned out to be uh, at a pivotal time. It was very pivotal, and it uh, it took up every evening <laughs> for 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 a long period of time. Um, but, it, but Lou was ready, and he obviously uh, uh, did a good job. And, and you, you were ready in, in, when you uh, came up after uh, uh, Lou. And in, in particular, uh, you saw it as a time when the Institute needed to uh, reassess a lot of things including the board relationship. And you had that uh, weekend um, retreat, I guess yes. you could call it, uh, with Amy uh, Katz as mm -hmm. the uh, facilitator. Uh, and the planning that came from that really moved the Institute through very productively through a number of years, uh, not the least being the fundraising that uh, became possible. Uh, now, uh, that kind of group activity went on at the beginning of the Institute, too, but it's a good legacy. <laughs> nice. That's a nice legacy. Uh, that really is. That yeah. really is a very nice legacy. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, associating to you and me speaking in our language and our language of pronouns. <clears throat> And I think when we began this discussion, the pronouns were all he. Uh, it was a group of men who got together. Um, and uh, there was Janet Newman, but largely it was a group of men. Um, and of course, Tilly Krug. Um, but you know, uh, with today's world having changed and psychoanalysis this world having changed, uh, women are such a crucial part oh, yes. of psychoanalysis. Yeah. Yeah. I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Tilly was one of the original uh, people in the building. Um, and there are many other women who have uh, be, uh, been important. I, I welcome it. I, I, I welcome the uh, uh, better balance that uh, exists now, uh, men and women. Uh, I'm, I left out a, an important person in my own development. Just happens, uh, it was it was a woman. I uh, I uh, took a elective as a fourth year student. I, w I went to Harvard, and. Uh, took a, a month at the Boston Psychopathic, and I learned about uh, shock therapy and uh, lobotomies, and, but I also learned about psychotherapy. And my mentor uh, during that month was Helen Tartikoff, who was mm. a training analyst. Mm. She's terrific. Uh, you know her? Oh, read her stuff. Well, she, she has some good stuff. And she, she turned out, we, we connected, and uh, that experience with her, and I sat in on some of her, her uh, interviews, clinical work, uh, was uh, almost decisive. Really? And uh, when I was applying 
uh, here uh, for, for residency, I gave her name as a reference and she uh, got in touch with me and said that the kinds of questions that uh, Dr. Levine was asking her, she needed to see me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was in Hartford. I went up to, to uh, uh, Cambridge and uh, had a, a little reunion with her. Isn't yeah. that interesting? But she was, uh, she was very uh, perceptive and uh, uh, very forthcoming, a good model. So I have one final question, and, and that's uh, if you and I could imagine a crystal ball sitting between us, um, we look once again, I think, at psychoanalysis in a challenging time. Um, the, the challenges today of the rampant growth of neuroscience uh, and what is being learned daily about the functioning of the brain, um, uh, both consciously and unconsciously, um, the popularity of cognitive behavioral treatments, uh, the demands of uh, third-party payers that we use evidence-based uh, treatments, um, these are not all new uh, in terms of challenges to psychoanalysis, but some of them are also opportunities. Um, and I wondered if you were to see um, a crystal ball and look at the Cincinnati Psychoanalytic Institute, I don't want to say 92 years from now, but <laughs> at some point in the future, yeah. uh, what, what, what do you see? I don't know, but I'm encouraged by the recent consensus, really, that the combination of all of these fields, uh, neurophysiology, cognitive studies, uh, relationship studies, are leading to a conclusion that your best results aren't any one, but a, an amalgamation or an integration of, of various approaches, including what would be analysis. Now, whether it's going to be long-term, multi-week, multi-times per week appointments, the use of the couch, uh, I'm not sure. But I uh, am convinced that analysis has had something unique to contribute. And there's a general consensus mm -hmm. that the best mental health results are a, including one-to-one -one experiences in a psychotherapeutic model of one kind or another and medication or, or whatever. That's encouraging to me. And I think, I don't know this for a fact, but I think the percentage of graduating uh, classes in medical schools, the, uh, there's a tick upward of the percentage of the class going into psychiatry. Interesting. Yeah. John, it's been a pleasure. It has been. Thank you so much. Yeah. Enjoyed it.